<laughs> Sounds good. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to get to speak at this conference. So since I'm giving the opening talk, I wanted to kind of give a feeling about the field. And in particular, there was one question I wanted to answer that I'm sure a few of you are asking, which is, why do we research scattering amplitudes? Some of you are already invested in this kind of research. Some of you are on the edge. You're curious about what this field involves. Well, to answer this question, I'm going to tell you a story. And some of you might have heard this story, story before. Amplitudes people like to tell it. It's a story that goes back to 1986. By that point, QCD had been complete for a decade. We understood the basic equations that govern quarks and gluons. And yet, despite that, only six particle gluon trees had been calculated and only numerical. You can calculate a five particle gluon tree amplitude in a quantum field theory class. You can assign this to your students. Five particles is harder. I've seen it assigned, but it was honestly kind of a bad choice on the professor's part. Um, but you can do it. It's not so hard. Six particles, 10 years after this theory had been fully laid out, still the only results were numeric. And past that, nothing. And they needed these results. This was before the LHC, but the Tevatron was up and running at Fermilab doing exactly the kind of collisions that needed these sorts of amplitudes. And so Park and Taylor tried to figure out whether there was a better way to write this down. See, here's the basic problem. If you wanted to write down a four particle tree amplitude, that's not so hard, four diagrams. You want to write a five particle tree amplitude, things are more difficult, 25 diagrams. Again, you can force your students to do it, but maybe you shouldn't. Six particles, now it's 220 diagrams. And it just keeps getting worse. But Stephen Park and Thomas Taylor noticed that there was a pattern. They noticed that in each of the known results, there was a common structure. They generalized it. They confirmed that the six particle numeric result obeyed this structure. They said what the analytic answer should be, and they were right. And they proposed what the amplitude needed to be for any number of gluons. And it ended up looking quite simple. For all plus solicity gluons, or for one minus and the rest plus, they get zero. But for two minus, well, here's what they got. Here they wrote it as the absolute value square of the amplitude, what you'd need if you were just calculating a cross section. But if anything, it's actually even simpler modern notation. So this is spinner helicity notation, which people in the amplitude field use all the time. And in this, it looks even simpler. And you can kind of see that there's this common, very simple structure. There's the spinner brackets one, two, to a given power here. They're only different because they're the first two elements, these negative helicities. And the rest is this just simple cyclic denominator. To these day, it's often called a Park-Taylor factor. Now this story, I'm not just telling it to you to rehash ancient history, but because point by point, this is what we do in this field. We do some calculations something that seems difficult, but that is absolutely necessary for some purpose. And we notice that there's a pattern. These are much simpler than they should be. We extrapolate the pattern. We use it to guess new results, to guess things that were previously beyond our reach. And we re-express those results. We write them in a new way, and we discover new properties that we can use to find new answers. And the cycle just keeps going. At first, Park and Taylor's result inspired just a few people. Some of them have talked at this conference before. But over the years, it's grown. And now there's, I think I can really say, a worldwide community of people interested in scattering amplitudes. Here on this map, 
I've colored every country from which there was someone who registered for Amplitudes 2021 last year when it was held on Zoom. And they're distributed, as you can see, all over the world. What I want to do in this talk is perhaps not cover everything, but highlight a few different directions that people are researching, each with impressive recent progress. If you want to see more about any of them, well, that's what the rest of the talks are for. Now, the key question that motivates many of us is this basic question of how to avoid Feynman diagrams. How do you not calculate all of these 226 particle diagrams, all of the many, many more diagrams you need when you start considering more particles or loops or anything like that? And people started figuring this out shortly after Park and Taylor. Barents and Gila figured out that you could build tree amplitudes recursively. And in 2005, Brito, Cachazo, Feng, and Witten figured out that you could do this using just on-shell momentum, just physical momentum. We have a slogan in this field, on-shell good, off-shell bad. This was the beginning of that slogan meaning something. If you want to get loops, well, once you can get the trees, you can fix what integrals you need to take, cutting that on zones. The simplest way is just to impose unitarity cuts. Just use the optical theorem. Cut the diagram in half. Loop diagram, you'll get two tree diagrams. But this is, can be generalized and was by the people I showed pictures of a few slides ago, Bern, Dixon, and Sauer who figured out that you can cut more momenta to fix more coefficients. If you cut enough, you can fix every term in this onsatz and figure out what the answer needs to be. These days, this method is really on the cutting edge. Various groups are trying to calculate five particle two loop amplitudes at the LHC. And for these people, a key element is this generalized unitarity method, cutting these five particle amplitudes apart to fix which integrals are required is much easier than drawing all the diagrams. There's an approach that's sort of a cousin, I would say, of generalized unitarity. I'm not going to say much about it because you'll hear a lot more in the talk by Roger Jose Hernandez Pinto later, but it's called loop tree duality. And it uses the same sort of notion that if you re-express things in trees, re-express pieces of your amplitude on shell, you can simplify things. In that case, it helps understand infrared divergences and make numerics more functional. Now this generalized unitarity method has been used in many cases. And I want to highlight something that's been done recently with it, where a group used it to find the six loop integrand for maximally supersymmetric Yang Mills theory. Now you might ask me, why would anyone ever calculate something at six loops? The LHC cannot measure anything at six loops. What is the point of this? Well, obviously it's to learn about gravity. What does gravity have to do with this? I'll explain. Kawhi, Llewellyn, and Ty were the first people to notice that in a variety of contexts, gravity is Yang Mills squared. They figured this out in string theory. You can express an amplitude for a closed string, a tree amplitude, in terms of amplitudes for open strings sewn together by this kinematic factor, something that's these days called a KLT factor after the authors. In field theory, to make this sort of thing really manifest, you need to impose something called color kinematics duality. So this was figured out by Bern Carrasco and Johansson in the later 2000s. And the idea is, if you've got some amplitude, in this case, I'm drawing it as a tree amplitude, in Yang Mills, you can write it out in terms of some color factors, some kinematic factors, and denominators that just come from the propagator. And the color factors have to obey these color Jacobi identities. 
what BCJ figured out is that you can also make the numerators satisfy these identities. And why would you do that? Well, at first, just it organizes things nicely. But second, if you square, you can use this organization to get gravity. From a gang mills amplitude, you can get a gravity amplitude just by replacing the color factors with additional numerators, either from the same yang mills theory or in some other theory that also has color kinematics duality. And this method works not just for trees, but it's been used for loop integrands as well. And it seems to be pretty robustly useful. There's some cases they haven't made it work yet, but most of the time it works. You can build up gravity as yang mills squared. And this has fueled some speculation. If gravity looks so much like Yang Mills in all of these calculations, maybe it's as well behaved as Yang Mills. Yang Mills with maximal supersymmetry doesn't have any UV divergences. It's a conformal theory. Gravity is not a conformal theory, even maximally supersymmetric gravity. But people have now speculated that perhaps maximally supersymmetric gravity is also ultraviolet finite. If it is, the first time it might diverge is at seven loops. So that's why this group is pushing all the way to six loops. They're hoping to eventually get to seven and do this calculation. So this can tell you things about quantum gravity. And that's, you know, one of the noble goals of the field, perhaps. But it can also tell you things about classical gravity. And there are two talks at this conference that I think will touch on this topic by Andres Luna and by Leonardo de la Cruz. You can do many different things with this in the classical regime. You can take classical solutions of Yang Mill theory, use the same sort of double copy story, and get classical metrics for gravity. And more recently, people figured out how to even get waveforms for LIGO. That is, if you want to calculate what happens when two black holes collide, well, you can treat the black holes as particles exchanging gravitons. You're computing a gravitational amplitude. That's been an extremely active field. Many groups, many papers, people have gotten really excited about this. When I describe the sort of set of steps that we go through. An important one was re-expressing amplitudes in new ways. If we can do that, we can notice new patterns, we can notice new properties, and we can use those properties to make our lives easier, to make our calculations more efficient. One, of these, one set of these methods writes down string theories that give field theory amplitudes. Cachazo, He, and Juan, came up with the CHY string. Mason and Skinner came up with ambitwister strings and later extended them with Geyer and Montero. These are both different types of models that share common traits. And in both cases, you take a very string theory picture, but you use it to calculate something in field theory. You have one diamond diagram, one Riemann surface per loop order. And so in some ways, these are much simpler pictures. And they make many important properties of these amplitudes manifest. They make this double copy mask in all sorts of interesting ways. There's a whole web of theories that you can stick together. You can make various sort of strange scalar theories, born Infeld, the nonlinear sigma model, some weird partial piece of string theory called Z theory using this logic. And it also makes soft limit these amplitudes. There are soft properties of different theories more manifest. Another story that's deeply tied to these soft limits involves something called the celestial sphere. So in this, one writes an amplitude um, in flat space in terms of its behavior on the boundary of flat space, which you can think about as a two-dimensional surface the boundary at infinity and is described by something that looks very much like a two-dimensional conformal field theory. And so this kind of logic 
first championed by Strominger and now by many other people working with and alongside him, is a new way to look at these amplitudes that also makes a lot of sort of interesting properties about soft limits, about the memory effect, more manifest. Another new language happens for something called the amplitudehedron. And I'll, I guess, lead up to it by explaining where it comes from. So this is all for maximally supersymmetric angles and specifically in the planar limit of the field. Only planar Feynman diagrams contribute. In this context, there's a geometric picture. If you build something out of on-shell momenta, that could be a tree, but it could also be, say, a cut of an amplitude. You can express it with something called the positive Grassmannians, mathematical geometrical structure. This structure was broadened to something called the amplitudehedron that can be used to find integrands for loop amplitudes. In that context, the integrands are differential forms with singularities on the boundaries of this geometric space. Now, it turns out this geometric picture, these spaces with what are called positive geometries, have had many other applications. There are other sorts of hedra, sociohedra, halohedra, in different theories, in different contexts. And there's been a lot of progress on that. Most recently, there's been a notion of what they've been calling negative geometries. When you look at these positive geometries from a different direction, sum them in a different way, and instead of perturbation theory, you can look at something that's really non-perturbative, that expands in a totally different way. Now, all of these methods I've been telling you about give you integrands. Generalized unitarity gives you an integrand. The double copy gives you an integrand. The amplitudehedron gives you an integrand. You still need to do those integrands. And there have been various methods developed recently that make that also a breeze. And the key is, at first at least, you shouldn't integrate every single diagram. There are what are called integration by parts relations between the different diagrams. For a while, people just tinkered with these things one by one, tried to solve them, writing them down. But Laporta figured out in 2000, even a little bit before, but I guess this is when it was published, um, that you could just turn the whole thing into an enormous linear algebra problem. And at that point, people started working to refine it. There were methods from algebraic geometry organized this problem in a better way, make it easier to solve, developed by people like Yang Shan. And there are applications of finite fields, where instead of doing this linear algebra with ordinary numbers, you do them with numbers in some finite field, modulo some large prime. It's developed and introduced by people like Wom and Teufel. So these methods have gotten very powerful in the years. But recently, also, people have been tinkering with an alternative. There's something called intersection theory, something that uses cohomo cohomology properties, something where you don't need to solve a giant linear system. You just look at how different cycles of different manifolds, you might say, it's sort of manifolds, intersect. People are still developing this, but it looks it's like in future, it might be almost as efficient or even more efficient than these integration by parts methods. Now, with all of this integration technology, plus all of the generalized unitarity before, plus some differential equations I'll mention on the next slide, people have made some really fantastic progress. There are three loop LHC processes that people have calculated. So this is the Drellian production. And it really matters that you can get to these sort of orders. You can kind of see on this plot that the leading order piece looks very different from when you add the next orders, from when you add next to leading order. This is a plot of how things change with the renormalization scale you're using. What you want is very little scale dependence. And these plots are very wide. They've got a lot of uncertainty and they still vary a lot with that. But as you go up higher and higher, 
you eventually get to a very well-determined three-loop result, something that you can really match to the Large Hadron Collider and get useful information. Okay, now I mentioned you still need to do the integrals even if you've got fewer integrals to do, and that's where these differential equations come. So in 2013, Johannes Henn figured out that you could write these differential equations in what's called a canonical form, where the epsilon of dimensional regularization gets factored out on the side. And once you do that, it becomes a lot easier to solve the equation. And you can find a solution in terms of functions called multiple polylogarithms. These are called multiple polylogarithms because there's kind of a logarithmic integration each time. So you do these dt over t minus a integrals, and each one is kind of introducing some logarithmic behavior, a new branch cut that you get if you analytically continued around the previous logs. These functions satisfy many different identities. And at first, that's a problem for calculating amplitudes. You want to know when two diagrams cancel or when two diagrams combine to something simpler. But luckily, these identities can be made manifest. There's something called the symbol of a transcendental function of a multiple polylogarithm. And these symbols can simplify things quite dramatically. So here's an example of a result from 2010. When a group calculated a symbol for a six particle two loop amplitude in this maximally supersymmetric Yang Mills theory, and it was 17 pages long. And that was you know, after they'd simplified. But later that year, a group consisting of three physicists, Mark Spradlin, Christian Vergu, and Anastasia Volovich, as well as a mathematician, Alexander Goncharov, figured out that you could use the symbol to simplify this expression down to just two lines. And it might look like I'm cheating a little here because there's these L4s that I haven't defined, these J I haven't defined. But if you look in the paper this comes from, those take up maybe two, three, four more lines. It's still a tiny expression compared to this massive one. It would be nice if we could do that for every integral we want to calculate. Unfortunately, we can't. That's because there are integrals beyond polylogarithms. So here's an example, again, from this maximally supersymmetric theory. This two loop diagram, this double box. This thing, if you want to actually calculate it, you'd find polylogarithms, but the last integration would be something very different a square root of a quartic polynomial. To write this, you can't write it in these polylogarithms. You need new types of integrals. These integrals involve elliptic curves. And people have developed recently new formalism to integrate these things. Formalism which writes, which thinks about them geometrically, not just as some mysterious polynomial, but as integrals on a torus, a torus connected to this elliptic curve. Recently, there's been a formalism for these things developed by Odal, Duor, Dulat, Finanti, and Tancredi that even physicists can understand after the mathematicians proposed one that we couldn't quite understand. And this has already been very useful in both phenomenological and supersymmetric calculations. But to go even further, and then things get much more mysterious. This diagram here, People call it a sunrise or a sunset diagram or a banana diagram. It looks sort of like a bunch of bananas. It was figured out by Bloch, Karen, Van Hove that it involves a calabi yau manifold. Same with these train track diagrams here, where myself and some collaborators figured this out. With these, you can draw any number of loops you like. You can add more rings, more bananas onto this bunch of bananas, more tracks onto these train tracks. In each case, you get more and more Calabi-Yau manifolds. 
These things are defined now by polynomial more variable. And so they're higher dimensional geometric objects, higher dimensional varieties. And for some reason, these particular ones involve Calabi-Yau manifolds. Particularly at L loops, they involve an L minus one dimensional Calabi-Yau manifold. So at two loops, that's an elliptic curve. At three loops, that's what's called a K3. But as you go higher, it gets worse. And things get even worse than that. So these are some other diagrams we found that have the same sort of property. There's weird Calabi-Yau manifolds in them. And because we're whimsical people, we named them after microscopic creatures. So uh, this one we called a tardigrade. You can kind of see it's got this sort of snout tardigrade. It's got the little legs. It's got the wrinkles. Maybe it's just me, but I think it looks like that. Um, and these ones are paramecia and amoebas. Each of these you can extend as long as you like in different loops. And it'll be a Calabi-Yau 2L minus 2 fold at L loops. So even at two loops, it's Calabi-Yau and not elliptic. It's a K3 manifold at two loops. It's a two-dimensional Calabi-Yau manifold. This two-loop diagram for this tardigrade, it's essentially a five-particle diagram. Looks like it has more, but you can think of these pairs as just massive particles. So three massive particles, two massless ones. Maybe you collide two gluons, get a W boson, get two W bosons and a Z, perhaps. The LHC is going to need this kind of information pretty soon. And we have no idea how to calculate these diagrams. We're working on it. We're trying to figure it out. But it's a wide open field at this point. Anyone who figures out anything useful is going to be making history in this subject. OK, so that's one kind of direction, is that you can do these integrals painstakingly, figure them out. It would be easier, though, if you could just guess the result. Right. Uh, sorry, uh, can I interrupt mm -hmm. just a second? Uh, yes, just yep. two slides before. Uh, what is that function of g in that integral? Ah, uh, yeah, that one. Ah, uh, yeah, this. Yeah, g so um, right. That's that's one of these polylogarithm functions. I'm I'm just being schematic here. Really, it's a sum of different ones. Okay, so th there is nothing to do with a metric, right? It is not right. a metric. No, no. No. Yeah, okay. No, this, 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 okay. Thank you. Yeah, sorry for the confusion. Yeah. No, this is just one of these polylogarithmic mm -hmm. functions. Yeah. The statement is just okay. you can do yeah, some of the okay. integrations like this. Yeah, but not all of them. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. And then for everybody else, do feel free to interrupt your questions. Okay. Well, if there's no more, then I can launch into talking about these bootstrap methods. So there's a phrase in English, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And it's supposed to be impossible, at least the way it's phrased that way. There's a series of uh, stories about this character called the Baron Munchausen. And in one of these stories, he falls into a swamp with his horse and then yanks himself up by his ponytail. He just grabs it, pulls, pulls himself out of the swamp. You can't do this, of course, because you need to actually be pulling from somewhere solid. But the interesting thing is that in quantum field theory, you almost can do this. You, you would think that in quantum field theory, the solid foundation is the Lagrangian. You write down your theory, you write down the fields, you know exactly what you're supposed to do. But you can do a lot without ever touching a Lagrangian or without ever touching Feynman. This was the dream of people in the 60s, the methods of the analytic S matrix. They tried to figure out what amplitudes needed to be from essentially first principles, not building up any particular theory, but just asking what amplitudes need to be, what are the requirements, and seeing if there were things that satisfied those requirements. They made a lot of progress, but I think it's fair to say they didn't really succeed. Nowadays, though, we're able to give this a second chance. 
That's because we know a lot more. We know about what amplitudes should be made of. We know about what should constrain them. Right? We're able to do things and propose things that the researchers in the 60s never would have considered. I mentioned these poly logarithms. Those things are defined by the kinds of integrals you do, these logarithmic singularities, these things giving you the branch cuts. And if you know those, you can build up a nonsense. You can say what kinds of functions should appear. If you know what singularities your theory is allowed to have or your amplitude is allowed to have, then for any order and perturbation theory, you can write down what you expect show up. You can write down this symbol that I mentioned before. And even more, you can build up the kinds of functions you need. Once you have this onsatz, and it can be a very big onsatz, you then start constraining it with physical principles, things that make sense. You can say, OK, what do its branch cuts have to be? And you notice that, well, branch cuts need to correspond to some factorization channel of the diagram some case where you're exchanging some bound state. And you can say, okay, depending on the states of your theory, what those need to be. And that limits your onsets. That constrains, that gives you information. You can impose symmetries, of course. Bose symmetry under exchanging bosons, but also if you have supersymmetry, that gives you even more power. And you can use kinematic data. You could use contexts in which people have found it easier to compute things. You can use collinear limits, where you know that the amplitude has to be related to an amplitude with few particles, when two particles become collinear. You can use Brecci limits, high energy limits of various sorts. All of these have been extensively studied by different people. And what you can do is just pull in things people know from different corners. This kind of method is very resourceful when it comes to that kind of thing. Figure out what everybody knows and build from that. And if you're lucky, that's enough to give you a unique result, one possible answer for a scattering amplitude. We've made the most progress with this kind of method in planar maximally supersymmetric gang mills theory. I've been involved with six particle amplitudes where we've pushed things with this method all the way to seven loops. We have a seven loop amplitude. I've put numerics for it here. So in case you've you know, never seen seven loop numerics, there isn't usually reason to have seven loop numerics, but we can do them, they're here. You go up in loop order and the amplitude kind of looks similar, but with some changes. This graph is of ratios of different loop orders. And you can see that the kind of diverges here because they cross zero at different points. But otherwise, there's kind of this smooth behavior. They diverge a little differently in one limit. They diverge a little differently in another limit. And the rest of the time, they have sort of a similar factor in each loop. Seven particle amplitudes. People have figured out how to calculate these things to four loops. And recently, this method's been expanded to three particle form factors. So one, say, Higgs and three gluons, still in this theory. They've published their five loop results, but talking to these people, they've now managed to get up to eight loops. And they'll be publishing that soon. And there have been even broader applications of these methods in recent years. People have used them to calculate a few specific quantities in QCD, things that are actually useful for collider physics. And there have been methods to calculate individual integrals, cases where you don't necessarily need the full amplitude, but where you can constrain one integral or another, doing this instead of an integration that might be hard to do. So that's what one might call the perturbative bootstrap. But there's also the non-perturbative bootstrap. And perhaps this connects even more to the dreams of the researchers in the 
they impose a, the conformal bootstrap imposes constraints that are in some ways deep constraints. Constraints that tell you something important in the field theory that we don't need to hold. Things like crossing symmetry, unitarity. And they look at different theories and they restrict the dimensions of operators and structure constants in the operator product expansion for these conformal theories. There's originally a numeric version of bootstrap. Now there's also an analytical version. And there's quite a lot that people do with this. It's an enormous subfield in its own way, really comparable, I'd say, to amplitude search. Carlos is going to be saying something about this field. So you can hear more about it in his talk. But one can get even closer, in some sense, to the dreams of those people in the 60s with an S matrix bootstrap. You can impose the same philosophy to S matrix elements, say, in a, a massive theory with a gap. Um, this weird monolith is involved. This is a region of allowed coefficients for one of these S matrices. I think Lucia is going to mention this, so I think her talk is actually going to be mostly on another topic, a more recent paper that I don't know enough to summarize here, so I'm looking forward to that talk. Finally, as sort of a related method, you can use the same kind of philosophy to restrict the coefficients of operators in an effective field theory. Here, in some sense, you're also constraining amplitudes. You're expanding tree amplitudes, for example, with some coefficients. Hmm. There's also been quite a lot of recent work in this field, imposing causality, imposing positivity of various sorts, imposing consistency with the theory of quantum gravity, trying to figure out what's allowed and what's not. There's something called an EFT hedron, yet one more of these hedra that people have proposed, that contains various known theories like string theory near the corners. All of these methods are kind of ways of exploring what's allowed in quantum field theory. And as we push them further, we get to know more and more about what's possible. So to close, there really is a lot going on in this field. I'm hoping this conference will give you a taste of just all the sorts of interesting things that people can do, whether it's chopping amplitudes apart in order to calculate something for the LHC, whether it's mixing together two different theories in order to calculate something for colliding black holes, whether it's reinterpreting amplitudes in a new way, whether it's discovering the consequences of our principles, bootstrapping things up, trying to go from a very sort of general notion of what's allowed to specific answers, to figuring out what theories exist, what theories can exist, and whether our theories are special, to exploring the deepest edges of string theory and quantum gravity. There's a lot to do. And as a field, I think we're really eager to have more people diving into this, more people interested, more people working towards understanding all of this vast world of scattering amplitudes. All right. I think I actually went a bit faster than I intended, but that's all I have for this talk. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Mati, for this very interesting talk. So, yes, we have plenty of time <laughs> to, to do a uh, question, question as you want. So, uh, please ra raise, uh, raise your hand or just speak if we have some questions. Hi, Matt. I thank you very much for this nice talk. Hi. Um, I have a naive question. Um, do you know why the people are computing scattering amplitude in these Calavillao backgrounds? I mean, it has something to, to do with uh, string phenomenology. Ah, sorry. So 
Yeah, I, I went through that slide quickly, which I guess means that it wasn't as clear as it should be. So the, the thing about these Calabiaos, it's not the background, at least for this that I'm discussing here. Um, in fact, it comes in a totally different way with no connection to string theory. It's a geometry you need just to do these integrals. If you try to do this integral, you can at first sort of get away with these functions that people are familiar with, these polylogarithms. But eventually you get this multi-variable polynomial. You can describe any one of these manifolds in terms of a polynomial. And it turns out that exactly the polynomials we find are the ones that describe Calabi-Yau manifolds. We don't really understand why. We can explain it in a few contexts, why this should match up. But in general, it's quite a mystery that this geometry that was reached for a totally different reason, because string theorists found it interesting for compactifying things for string phenomenology, shows up just trying to integrate a diagram that you'd use, you know, even for LHC physics. I see. Thank you very much. We have, we have more time to make some questions. Hi, Matt. How are you? Hey. Um, I have a, also a naive question. So if you, because I, I see that you have computed also to seven loops, if I understood correctly. So what is, mm -hmm. the, what is the difficulty to do like a predictions for the, the LA, like the LHC? Because you show that for um, in, the, in your initial slides, like they have uh, recently, like uh, for N3 uh, LO, was it the difficulties for you if you if you want to apply it that because if you already solve it, it, will, it should be simpler. <laughs> I know yeah. that is not simple. <laughs> no, yeah. So, <laughs> but I want to know what is the difficulties for you to to like uh, make right. uh, Yeah. So it's essentially that the theory I was doing this in is much more convenient than QCD. Um, so planar maximally supersymmetric gang mills, it's got a lot of symmetries, and so you need to consider a much smaller space of kinematics. Um, for anything at the LHC, the kinematic space grows, but also the kind of detailed information we have shrinks. We were really lucky to have predictions, not just in the leading collinear limit, but subleading collinear limits um, coming from integrability. It's a lot harder to find that kind of prediction for QCD processes. But we are, you are getting close, I hope. <laughs> yeah, sounds, because, yeah, because because you you if you have already all these collinear limits, it should be as you as you said because we uh, we try to guess more or less what is what you should add in order to cancel these singularities. What has to be the behavior? As you said, you you have a very uh, you gave a very nice. Uh, talk by the way, I, I I love it a lot, um, but also you have to like uh, do it by hand. Some of these things try, if it's not working, you try another one. Um, but it is it was very very interesting and congratulations. Thank you, Roger, for your question. Is anyone? We have time. <laughs> Maybe I can ask something. Hi, Matt. Good to hey. see you. <laughs> Likewise. Um, so you were mentioning this supergravity at the beginning and the fact that there is some seven loop interest. <laughs> can you explain mm -hmm. more about why seven loops or, yeah, what is this mm. prediction for, for seven loops? Yeah, yeah. So there's, so essentially, there was kind of a series of things where people first expected the divergence to be earlier and then realized it had to be postponed. Um, kind of in each case, they noticed there was some extra symmetry that postponed it further. And I think for the seven loop one, the final nail in the coffin was sort of some uh, complicated E77 symmetry of the uh, of the scalars. But basically what's going on at each step is they're constraining counter terms. They're saying, okay, well, you can't have just a normal sort of 
r to the fourth because of this. You can't have this next counter term because of supersymmetry. You can't have this next term because so on and so on. And then the first counter term that obeys every constraint they can think of is seven loops. OK, <laughs> thanks. But it's not, uh, uh, I mean, it could still be at 10 loops if people find out that there was something else. That... Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the people who propose seven loops are, you know, swear up and down that there's nothing else that has to be there. But um, I, I don't know whether we should trust them because the other <laughs> steps were surprises. So it could well be there's some other principle that postpones it even more. All right. Hello, Matthew. Um, I have another okay. question. Um, uh, so you mentioned that all these methods uh, provide a way to compute the integrant of the amplitude, right? At a particular loop level. Uh, but as you said, we still have to integrate, right? So what method would you recommend or you think is more efficient to compute the integrals? These days, as long as it's something that can be expressed in these multiple poly logarithms, I think the differential equation kind of methods are usually the most efficient. Now, if you just want numerics, there's other things you can do. There's something called sector decomposition, which is pretty efficient as far as I understand it. But for getting an analytic answer, which is good if you want to say analytically continue it to different regions or get really inclusive cross sections so Take, can take derivatives, things like that, um, then I think this is still kind of the cutting edge method. This and elaborations on this, ways that people have extended it. I'm hoping that in the future, bootstrap methods can do this. But as you know, was pointed out, they're not quite there yet. Oh, okay, so then you would recommend a uh, differential equation method. Yeah, I think for most problems, the right approach. Again, if it's if it's something that can't be written in these kinds of nice polylogarithmic functions, then it's much more mysterious what you should do. Right. And I think there's some cases where there's another integration method that people have been using to great success. Um, I, I think I didn't talk about it, just uh, didn't think of a good set of pictures to pair it with. But there's a sort of a direct integration method that people sometimes use where you um, more directly express things in this kind of form, but it's it's not as sort of a general purpose. The differential equations, I think, as long as you can do this, will pretty much always work. Okay. Nice talk, by the way. Thank you. Thanks. I also forgot to say it was a very nice talk. <laughs> Oh. Very nice overview. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, uh, we are uh, listening many questions, which is uh, very good. That's what we uh, plan. Um, if there are no more questions, let me ask uh, the last question. Uh, in, in all the results uh, in amplitude that you very nicely uh, cover in this overview, uh, how do you divide them between the massless case and the massive case? I mean, mm. which of the ones are only for the massless uh, amplitudes and uh, what you can comment on massive amplitudes? Mm. Yeah, that's, a, that's an important point. Um, so generalized unitarity has been used for both. So some of these five um, particle calculations involve amplitudes. It's, I think, a little trickier because you can't just use these spinner helicity variables I showed earlier. There's a massive generalization of them that people are starting to use. Um, but I think that can be used there. Uh, my understanding is that loop tree duality is also perfectly okay with masses. Uh, the double copy, again, people have extended it to massive cases. I think it's most natural in a massless case, but people have managed to do massive things with it as well. 
Um, and certainly for these LIGO things, the black holes have masses, um, though the particles they exchange don't. Uh, let's see. Here, I mean, these theories are usually massless theories. The celestial sphere is also usually talking about massless theories, um, though there's sort of massive line on this, which suggests that sometimes they think about them anyway. Uh, the amplitudehedron is purely for a massless theory. Um, though I'm not sure if some of the hedra they've proposed are for massive theories, but I don't remember any of it are besides the EFT hedra. Uh, the integration by parts methods you can use on anything. Same thing with the intersection. Massive, massless, doesn't matter. It's made progress in both fields. Differential equations, once again, you can use them in most cases, but I will say that masses make it much more likely that you fall into these kinds of cases beyond polylogarithms. So there are two loop massive diagrams that already involve these elliptic curves. And similarly, this diagram here, I didn't distinguish it when I talk about them, but this one is massive, the one above. The one down here is massless. So I really should have drawn the lines a little differently. Maybe you made these thicker or something. But this shows up in both cases. Uh, let's see, these are all massless diagrams, but massive diagrams will probably have similar issues. And then these bootstrap methods, we've mostly used them for massless theories for these kind of perturbative methods, but probably one could use them for a massive theory. Again, it's just more kinematic variables gets more difficult. For the non-perturbative ones, there's the conformal bootstrap and conformal theories. The S matrix bootstrap is for massive theories and the EFT bounds um, allow for either. Okay, I think that's, yeah. So that's all the stuff, <laughs> just to be comprehensive. Okay, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your uh, very nice talk. And, uh, I think that uh, we will uh, uh, take a little break of uh, like uh, seven minutes to uh, start on, on short time for the for the next talk. So uh, on, the, on the distance, let's uh, give an applause to Matt. Actually, actually, while we were on the break, can I ask a quick question? Uh, of course, yeah. Yes, uh, first, uh, thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering, I mean, probably well, you have already explained, but uh, is there any application of this amplitude hedron? Sorry for my pronunciation. I don't know if I pronounced correctly. Amplitude hedron? I think different people pronounce it differently, so it yeah. doesn't much okay. matter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, yeah. So is there any application of that in string theory? I mean, like what part of string theory has that application? I mean, do you know? Can you comment something? Mm. Yeah, so, so the some of this positive geometry stuff does have an application in string theory. Uh, there's some recent interest where they've sort of calculated these kind of uh, string-like integrals, so sort of things that look a bit like string tree integrals. Um, where you can kind of see this positive geometry making an appearance again. Um, I don't know a lot of details about it, but it's sort of recent papers with Bakani Hamed and some of his collaborators. Okay. Okay, okay. Yeah, pro pro I mean, because I, I don't have much idea. So is there any, uh, any application on the metric of the Calabio uh, from this amplitude part, amplitude hadron part, or not? Maybe this is just a stupid question. Mm. Like the geometry, because we don't know the yeah. metric of the Calabria, right? So right, yeah, uh, yeah. No, I mean, not that I'm aware of. I mean, you'd kind of need, okay. yeah, you'd still sort of need some direction with which to calculate, and yeah, um, yeah, pr probably. Yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah, not not anything near term anyway. Okay, yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.